I do welcome you to this, and when I'm welcoming you to, to this event, which is our 32nd annual Distinguished Lecture, I always say, well, how can you welcome your own family, you know? But because we are, many of you are students and alumni and our friends. Some of you are our clinical partners, and so it is all in the family, but tonight, I think, is going to be a particularly special night. And it has to do with the focus that we've been taking in the College of Nursing. I don't think any of you, particularly undergraduate students, uh, and particularly I would think those of you who are juniors and seniors and are taking advantage of the Conley Delouvrier scholarships that take you abroad in your um, required courses, recognize that we have taken very, very aggressive global focus. It's always been an interest at Villanova. It's always been an interest in the College of Nursing. But now that we have our Center for uh, Global and Public Health, now that we have the resources to send you outside the country to appreciate and understand cultures, health needs, and to actually make a contribution and begin to shape and form your own careers around those interests, um, we think that we're at a point now where we can really make a contribution, not only as individuals, but as a college, to ameliorate many of the problems that we all recognize that as not only public, but global health issues. We began this lecture really for you. 32 years ago, College of Nursing was 25 years old. And so one of the things we did to celebrate that anniversary, and now you can, if you do math, you know I'm not as young as I look, um, was to do something that was very special and academic, something that annually would mark our anniversary. And so this lecture was developed and continues year after year. This year in particular, um, I am very pleased that the committee, uh, whom I thank, have brought to us Dr. Leslie Mancuso, because long before being a global citizen was really, what shall I say, as popular, uh, expected of professionals, uh, long before the interest was as great as it is now, Leslie Mancuso was a, was a pioneer and a major contributor, as she still is in this area. She has had a brilliant career she is a consummate professional and leader in nursing and in healthcare worldwide. Most of all, she is a friend and colleague. She comes to us uh, with degrees from the University of Pennsylvania. She's a good friend of our former assistant dean of the, of the undergraduate program, now the dean at Gwynedd Mercy, Dr. Hollingsworth, who's back with us tonight. And do you know what else? How many of you know Dr. Chi? Bing, bing. Okay. She discovered Dr. Chi. It was during her time with Project Hope that Bing Bing was at Beijing Medical University, and Leslie Mancuso realized that she had met someone with talent. And the rest is history because Dr. Chi came here, she got her master's, she went back to China. She was supposed to stay in China and do great things for China. But she came back to our country, got her doctorate, and now we have her here. So I want to thank you, Leslie, for contributing to our faculty recruitment without even knowing it many years ago. Um, but seriously, um, Dr. Mancuso has always been a very good friend of Villanova, although she is not one of our alumna. We wish she were. And I think you're going to learn a lot from her tonight, and you will enjoy her immensely. So I will ask Beth Dowdell, will do a formal introduction, is that correct, of Dr. Mancuso. And I hope you enjoy the evening. I know you will enjoy her. Welcome, Leslie. Good evening and welcome. It is my pleasure to introduce Leslie D. Mancuso, who is a leader in the international health community. She is recognized for her pioneering work in neonatal and pediatric health care. 
And currently, she is president and CEO of JAPIGO, an international nonprofit health organization affiliated with the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Mancuso offers a rare blend of experience within the world of international public health. She is a nurse with years of experience in clinical settings and academe. She is a recognized international business leader with a track record of success for bringing accountability and navigating change in the international nonprofit world. As you just heard, Dr. Mancuso was working with Project Hope, serving as their COO and CEO. Dr. Mancuso came to Japigo in 2002. Under her leadership, Japigo has grown from a $5 million to a $62 million organization, increasing its programs from four to 70 and serving the needs of over 55 countries today. Dr. Mancuso oversees Japigo's longstanding and extensive relations with international agencies, ministries of health, education, nursing, midwifery, medical schools, professional associations, and local non-governmental organizations. Dr. Mancuso received her undergraduate degree in nursing from Southern Connecticut University, her master's in nursing from the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing, and her doctoral degree in organizational leadership from the University of Pennsylvania. She completed the executive leadership program at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard in order to round out her understanding of the business and healthcare at the intersections of government business and public policy. Dr. Mancuso takes an active leadership role in many organizations serving on their boards. She is a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing, the American Society of Association Executives, the Center for Association Leadership. She has received numerous honors, including the Lillian Gruner Award for Innovative Practice in Nursing from the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. Maryland's Top 100 Women Award in 2008 by the Daily Record, the Maryland International Business Leadership Award from the World Trade Center Institute, and has received an honorary doctorate in science from Shenandoah University. It is with great pleasure that I hope you will join me in welcoming Dr. Leslie D. Mancuso. Well, good evening, everyone. It's truly wonderful to be here. First, let me thank um, Dean Fitzpatrick. Thank you. Thank all your faculty. Um, I have dear nursing colleagues that are here this evening. Uh, she mentioned Andy, and of course, I have many others like Fran and Bing Bing, and my friend Jane is here. And, um, and most importantly, I know I have our future nursing colleagues. It is truly special for anyone that knows me to have a moment to speak uh, to our uh, future colleagues and the nurses that we will look up to um, certainly in the years to come. So tonight, let us start with a theme, a theme that I've been using quite often because it's actually a theme that drives me. The theme is, it was done, it was said by Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change that you want to see in the world. And as I visit with nurses around the world, and as I look out at all my nursing colleagues, I know that each of you have made this statement a reality. This year is, inter is the International Year of the Nurse. And when we think of nursing, we have to bring ourselves back to Florence Nightingale, and I know now the students are dying. I need to bring you back to Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale had a vision for nursing. She had a vision for modern nursing. Florence Nightingale believed that all people deserved quality services no matter where they were in the world. She believed in a healthier world for all people. She believed in compassionate care for all people. That was Florence Nightingale. And as I travel the world, I spend 80% of my time overseas. I just arrived from the Philippines on Saturday, and I leave uh, this Saturday for Zambia. I visit with nurses everywhere I go in every part of those countries. And everywhere I go, I see nurses 
who themselves are being the change that they want to see in the world, who themselves are looking at what they want for their countries, what they want for their communities. It is a role that all of us need to believe in is the most special role one can have in the world if we're going to change the health of the world. As a nurse, first and foremost, first and foremost, as a leader, as a CEO, as a teacher, and as a woman, it's been my distinct honor to travel around the world and see the enormous accomplishments of nurses everywhere. And while we have many, many accomplishments, we also are striving to meet the Millennium Development Goals. As all of you know, a standard was set, a standard that countries like Rwanda and Ethiopia and India and Indonesia are all talking about. All of those countries looking at standards, many countries realizing that they may not reach those standards. But it's the standards of, of care, it's the standards of looking at the lives of mothers and children. And it's for all of us a way to look at what we need to do for our world. We are not done yet. What is my change? What is my change with my team, my leaders, the group that I work with? Well, our change is about preventing the needless deaths of mothers and their children. Our change is saying that no mother should die when we know what needs to be done. Our framework is a framework that believes that the world must have women, that the world must have mothers. Our framework knows that if a mother dies, the likelihood of a child dying under the age of two is 10 times greater. If a mother dies, the likelihood of a child not getting immunized, not having nutrition, not going to school is much, much higher. We know without a woman, without a mother, the fabric of a family is dissolved. And we know that when the family is not together, the effect on the country and the effect on the world is too powerful not to accept right now. And so our vision is to have that mother and have that child, that child that's immunized, that child that's healthy, that child that's going to school, that family intact. That's our vision. That's our change. That should be our vision for health around the world. So let's talk about the world. Tonight as you sit here, in the world one woman every minute, little over a minute dies. 60 minutes, 60 women will die in the world. In our world, more than 340,000 women will die this year due to pregnancy-related causes. And we know how to save 80% of those women. You see, we already know it. We already know what to do. In our world, 90% of all the deaths of, of pregnant women are in the developing world. That's our scenario right now. What else? In our world today, one woman every two minutes dies of cervical cancer. In our world today, 274 women will die this year due to cervical cancer. In our world today, 80% of all cervical cancer deaths are in the developing world. And unfortunately for women, with the advent of HIV AIDS, in my travels, we are seeing more and more women with cervical cancer along, co alongside HIV AIDS. As we sit here tonight in our world, 10,000 pregnant women will die this year. 200,000 infants will die. And the saddest part is, is when you work in sub-Saharan Africa, 400,000 women will have severe anemia. Many, many premature babies will be born. And again, malaria complicates so many other things these women may have. In our world, as we sit here tonight, 60,000 adults that have HIV, IV, IV, HIV AIDS are women. 
And the tragedy of all, which I see so much in my travels, is the number of orphans that are left behind. I said to someone this evening, I've been to 10 countries since January, and I was in Mozambique recently, uh, a couple weeks ago, and I went out to see a counseling and testing done where you go household to household. It's in a village. And as part of this community, there's an NGO, and I met this incredible, incredible, most powerful individual I've ever met. She is a nun that is running this uh, orphanage for children with HIV AIDS. But her decision was, I will not leave the other siblings behind. If this child is orphaned, I will take the whole family, which is not necessarily how it's always done. And so you saw the little girls that were sisters holding each other's hands, bringing their sisters over to me so I could meet them. And I saw what, this, what, this, what she was doing with teaching these children and trying to figure out how she could give them skill sets so they could be productive citizens in their country. It was an extraordinary experience, but it always brings me back to when you lose a mother, this is what happens. This is what we have to be concerned about in our world today. So what are we doing? What is Japigo? Japigo is one organization doing it. It's one team of people. Um, it was founded more than 40 years ago, close to 40 years ago. We're a part of Johns Hopkins University. We've worked in more than 140 countries to date. We're currently in 54. Now you're going to see a, you're going to see a, bat, a number. We are now a $129 million organization. We've had a, a few good years. Uh, we are now 129, and I have more than 950 physicians, nurses, midwives, and public health managers that work for us all around the world. I have an incredible team. What do we do? You know, our belief is that you have to build and strengthen systems, that in order to change and help people uh, help their own country, you have to give them the capabilities. You have to strength, look at their system and strengthen their system. We're about working in partnerships with ministries of health, the government, local NGOs, the schools of nursing, the schools of midwifery, the schools of medicine, the communities. All of those are important in our organization. Someone asked me at the reception, you know, who do you meet with when you go out? And I said, you know, um, it varies, but generally because we're a partner, I meet with and have opportunities to meet with the First Lady of Tanzania, the First Lady of Rwanda, the President of, of Zanzibar, the First Lady of Zanzibar, um, Ministers of Health always, U.S. government, certainly the embassies. Our role is to look at helping them make the change for their country. It is their country. And therefore, our programs must fit into their country, their culture, and they must drive that change. It is their change, not our change. We work in all different areas. You can see them, maternal, newborn health, HIV, AIDS, TB, infection prevention, cervical cancer, malaria and pregnancy, and the like. And our fabric is about focusing in on the health workers. Focusing in on the team. Who is the team that is seeing and working with those women? The nurses, the midwives, physicians, community health workers, the community. That's our role. So let's talk about cervical cancer first. Cervical cancer, maybe for all of you, some of the students perhaps, you've heard a lot about it recently because you've heard about it via the commercials and the vaccines. But let's talk about this. Cervical cancer has been around for years, but nobody really talked about it years ago. You know who talked about it? The countries. You go into any country, bar none, you go to the Philippines, you go to Burkina Faso, you go to any country and ask them, do you have cervical cancer? And the physician's heads go down, and the midwife's heads go down, and they say, yes. You see, cervical cancer in the developing world is something that has, there is no screening. In most of the low-resource countries of the world, there are no pap smears. Women have never been screened. And so, unfortunately for these women, they get cervical cancer at a time that they're mothers, at a time that they have many children. 
And as we all know, it is only found when they have severe abdominal pain. And health workers will tell you about the most awful death they have seen is women with cervical cancer. In fact, when I was in Burkina Faso, a physician who I, uh, Dr. Balami Dow, a brilliant, brilliant physician, uh, works very closely with midwives and nurses, uh, brought me to his hospital, which is down in Bobo, which is in the south in Burkina Faso. And he says, Leslie, this is the woman. This is the room that the women go to. This is the room that the women die in. And he says, I don't want them to, and I know you have. You have a program so that we can screen women. So let me tell you what happened. So years ago, when everyone was looking at what can we do, you see, think about pap smears. If you have pap smears, you have to have the test. You have to have a lab. You have to have people trained in the lab. You have to have a mail system or some way to find those women. There's, you, you have to think about all that we have here in this country to be able to make a pap smear work. It works here if you have access. But in these countries, we had to come up with another solution. So a group got together and knew one thing. They started with a piece of science and evidence. They said, if we use acetic acid vinegar and you put it on mucous membranes, that the atypical cells will turn colors. And with atypical cells, you could then freeze those cells with a cryotherapy unit, which does not require electricity. And so this work has been done. It's been published in Lancet. You'll, we have, uh, it's been published in um, the Zimbabwe study was published in Lancet. It's been published in other peer-reviewed journals. It had to be proven. People were certainly nervous. Why not do pap smears? Well, we really can't. Well, let's look for another solution. And so in the global world, we're constantly saying, are there low-cost, effective solutions? This one has taken a while, but let me tell you the fabric of this. This isn't just about what I talked about. It had parameters around this program. The parameters were that we had to be able to teach health workers that we're actually going to see these women. Novel idea 10, 15 years ago. You mean we're going to teach nurses and midwives to do this? It had to be done where we could screen and treat them in one visit so that you wouldn't lose them to follow up. Now, having said that, there are some countries where the woman must go home to her husband and ask. And so there is, you know, there is that piece, but that's not always at all. Many women choose to have it, and as soon as one of their sisters or aunts have it, they come in. And so you have to change this practice from the policy and standards level so that you can have, this is long before people talked about task shifting and task sharing. Japagos always believed that nurses could be doing so much more in these countries than they're being allowed to do. And so we've pushed this envelope for years. And so here we had to create the standards that allowed it. We had to create the policies. We had to work with the OBGYNs as to why perhaps that wasn't the best. That's not to say they wouldn't do it, but it is to say you were looking at that health worker that was in the right place where these women would come. And then we had to follow them up. Right now, it's being done in all parts of the world. Now, the interesting piece of this is that PEPFAR, and some of you may have heard of PEPFAR. I would think the students have. PEPFAR is a funding base that was started under the Bush administration to work with HIV AIDS. It's an HIV AIDS funding base. And it was really a big funding source. And those of us in the global health world talk about PEPFAR because it was really the advent of getting people on medicine for HIV AIDS. And it was in the advent of counting and, and, and having an understanding of HIV AIDS. Well, you know, obviously we were concerned that with the increase of HIV AIDS in women, what would we do? What could we do? We were saying to everyone that would listen, if in fact a woman lives with HIV AIDS but then dies of cervical cancer, is that really what we should accept in our global health world? And so as a result of that, there was a lot of discussion. And the reason you're seeing African countries on this is because, in fact, PEPFAR is now allowing funds to be used for this program, for cervical cancer screening. So let me tell you a story about Thailand. 
I think Thailand's a perfect example of what can happen by the capacity of a country. Thailand's a country that had pap smears for 20 years, and only 5% of the women in that country accessed the pap smear for a variety of reasons, where they lived, their, their financial situation, many reasons that we all know. And so when this was introduced, of course, we had to work with the OBGYN Society. We have an incredible, Dr. Kabi Kopchik, an incredible uh, woman, OBGYN, that said, of course the nurses and midwives can do this. We don't need to do this. And she became a staunch advocate for not making that choice, but offering another alternative, particularly to women throughout that country. And so it's been her drive, once we taught the program, it is her drive that has now screened. The country has now screened 500,000 women for cervical cancer. That's a story of building a capacity within a country and letting that country do for themselves. They're doing it without us. They're, they're, they're on their own. They're training other nurses and midwives. They're moving this program along. And women are getting screened, treated. And obviously, if the treatment, the treatment is for a certain size, atypical cells. So if it's larger, then they get referred. So that's the other piece of it. But I look at her every time I meet her, and I think she's been working now in Vietnam. She gets asked to go to Africa. She was the spearhead to say, there's not a no to this. Women are dying. I'm not taking no. We're going to figure out the solution. So it's an exciting time. Now, what we're doing with her right now is looking at the vaccine. You know, for people that hear these techniques, they go, well, just bring the vaccine. But think about it. The vaccine only works for young. It doesn't work for those that, that already may have the virus. They can't afford it. It's not cost effective yet. And one of the things we have to look at is where, where would it work best? Perhaps it will work in her screening clinics better than it will work in a school system. And so right now we'll look at that. But we will always say that screening must accompany everything. So there's other things out there. There's a HPV test out there. There's many different things. But we will always be adamant that all countries deserve to have a screening program and women should be screened. Another program is a program that you know, in the U.S. government world, we all talk about maternal, newborn, child health. And unfortunately, in our world, it became very siloed. Sound familiar? You know, you had the children's and the, you know, I'm saying this because we all think that. You have the maternity and you have all the different silos. But let me tell you the problem with those silos. The problem with those silos when the reality hits when we're in the countries we're in is if a woman's pregnant, she goes to the antenatal clinic. But when, if she's willing and someone guides her to get screened for HIV AIDS, she has to go over to another building. Now, the other building sometimes can be very nice because it's been funded, PEPFAR funding, it's, it's very nice. But she's got to go over there. Let's say she has HIV AIDS. She goes here for her maternal care and there for her HIV AIDS treatment. And so all of us have been saying, you know, we've got to look at integration. And the U.S. government, two and a half years ago, decided to do a large-scale award that would take a very large partnership, and we would focus on integrating maternal child health. Now, the key was it was going to focus on a variety of countries. And so right now, this program is working in 37 countries. Its focus was to focus on high-impact interventions. See, what I said to you earlier is we know how to save 80% of women. We know what we need to do with newborns and children. And so what this does is takes the best and figures out how we scale them up as quickly as possible and we get them out there. Organizations, we're, we're the, Japigo is the lead organization, it's a $600 million award. We're the lead organization, but groups that you know, like Save the Children, John Snow International, Macro International, many other organizations are part of it. Again, its goal was to look for ways to integrate. Obviously, we know a lot about maternal child health. We know, and many of you, certainly the students have learned a great deal in their classes. We know certainly that if a woman has and doesn't take malaria medicine, 
alongside having bed nets, she may get malaria. Now that's easier said than done. If a woman doesn't go for an antenatal visit in our countries until her last several months, she has missed the doses of malaria medicine. So we have to find models and community-based systems that either get that woman into the facility and or ensure that she takes her medicine. A country I was to recently said, well, Leslie, it's really great. We, we try to watch them take medicine, but you know what? We didn't have cups. We didn't have water. So our facility had to figure out how to get water and cups to make sure. So, you know, you're constantly looking at the logistics and the system that will allow you to do it. Active management of the third stage of labor is critical, critical for midwives and nurses to know and to learn. We know that works. It's not, a, it's not a let's test this out. We know it. But we need to scale that up and get all these countries to, to do it. We know a partograph is very helpful. We know, but we only know in many countries only 20% of the midwives are using it for a variety of reasons. We know so much about how to save these women. Two other things. We know if they go to a skilled attendant, a midwife nurse, we know women will live. WHO has said that. It's in the WHO proclamations. With skilled attendant, we know women have a much better chance to live. We also know in facilities they have a much better chance to live. So this is what we're trying to take in this program, is taking all that we know and figuring out how to scale it up. That's the critical part. Certainly, the other piece that a lot of us are talking about now, that probably all of you, if any of you are looking at the global health, and let me equate, one thing I wanted to say to you, and I was saying this to some of the faculty, I see global health as health around the world. Global health is exactly what it says. Global health is if some of you are working here, you are part of the global health movement. What you do here affects the world. What you do here affects the health of the world. So global health as it is, is really the whole world. I, I wanted to make sure I said that. But one of the challenges we're talking about now is a whole issue of point of care. And the fact that we need to look at where a woman access, accesses health care along the continuum. We need to think about the fact that in some scenarios, a woman is four hours away. Will she access that health care? And if she won't, what can we do at the community level that will feed into the next levels? And so we're always talking about the household to hospital continuum. Where in this country are women accessing health care? How can we get them into facilities? And if they're not, what models can we develop? that will allow us to screen, do prevention, and many other things. So let's talk about some of the new innovations that are going on. The number one reason in the world that women die in childbirth is hemorrhaging. And as all of you know, we actually know a great deal about what to do to prevent the hemorrhage and to take care of that hemorrhage. But some of that take care requires medicines. It requires skilled attendants. It requires a facility that has the ability and, and they understand how much blood loss a woman is having. It takes an attentive person that's with that woman. And when you have women on the floors everywhere trying to get care with one health worker, it's very, very difficult. So here's one of the challenges of the continuum of care. What we needed to look at our global world, we started to, oh, there's Mary. We started to talk about, sorry, sorry, another friend. We started to talk about, um, we started to look at the whole issue of what happens if you're in the community and you don't have access. You can't get to a facility. So there's been work done that looked at the whole issue of using community-based misoprostol. Now, it was based on the theory that you could teach a mother to take these pills after she delivered. That you could involve the husband, the family. You, could, you would work with the midwife that was either based or, or near that community. But it was based on that principle. 
And everyone said, no, no, no. You cannot give that accountability to a mother. It, it will, because if they take this pill at the wrong time, it'll be devastating. You cannot do that. And you know, the world global community said, we think mothers could. We actually think mothers could be, could do this. And so it's taken a very long time in our community to get the community to accept that misoprostol actually is. I believe very soon in the spring, we're hoping uh, that there will, WHO will come out with this. But let me, with the approval of this, let me say, but let me say it's being done all around the world. This was tested out in Indonesia and no mother took it at the wrong time. At the same time now, it's being used throughout Afghanistan. We're, we uh, work all over Afghanistan. And as you know, Afghanistan, parts of Afghanistan, the north, are the second highest maternal mortality in the world. There are no caregivers in most of the communities throughout Afghanistan. So we had to come up with something that would allow a mother. But you know what the data came out, the data so far, mothers are taking it at the right time. And mothers are actually saying, if I had my way the next time, I would go to a facility. So the other argument was, oh, they won't go to the facilities. But actually, they're now seeing the benefits of the medicine, the caregivers, and how to make this work. That's an innovation, and watch this innovation in years to come. Certainly, it's something. It's a point of care in the community that allows us to save women's lives. The number two reason women die in the world is preeclampsia pre and eclampsia. You know, in the United States, when women are pregnant, you go in, they say, take iron, take calcium, let me take your blood pressure, you get your urine check for protein. Well, in the world in which I work, the only time they know about preeclampsia is when the woman is coming in seizing. And so, in fact, I was out in Tanzania, the first lady was doing a safe motherhood day in a very uh, uh, remote town. Um, it was a wonderful day, it was all about having women be safe. And they did a role play. There were thousands of people in, in the town. Everyone was there. Uh, they had flags. Everything was about safe motherhood. And it was incredible to watch. But they did a skit. And what was interesting for me is the part of the skit was about a woman, and she was seizing. And you could tell the whole crowd knew exactly what that was. So what do we need to do? Here's some innovations. We're now, right now, working with a number of women in communities around with something called calcium sprinkles. There's a theory that we actually could reduce, like you take calcium, we could reduce preeclampsia in women. But the, but the challenge is, if any of you know what's going on in the world of uh, nutrition, people try to give children or families biscuits and they say, well, we don't eat biscuits, we eat rice. Uh, people tr have tried many different ways with nutrition to look at how can we give them supplements that they actually would eat. This one's still in the study phase. There were, it's a very low cost solution. They're making the calcium satchels in, in India. We actually uh, had tested some of it out in, in Nepal. But the, the theory was to see would women, if you put it on their regular food, take it? And is it going to make a difference? Now, this is the science world that we're in, all of the students here. The science world that we're in is we've got to prove this. We also have to prove, is this going to make a difference? Does calcium actually, is that the problem that we need to be addressing, or is that going to help in, the, in these countries? And there's a lot of people that are talking about this as to whether, yes, it's going to help or no, it's not. But at least we're looking at innovative solutions in the, in the areas. Without question, another device that's being developed, we work with the School of Biomedical Engineering now. We decided that we wanted to work with the engineering students and teach them about thinking about low-cost solutions for the global health world. And so we started, I had started having some of my staff go over there, giving them ideas. We have women dying of this. We have this situation. This is what we really need. Could you do it? And it's been incredible. We brought 15 biomedical engineering students all around the world last summer to show them what we mean when we say there's no water and no electricity. And find a solution when you could do that when you don't have those. Or find a solution when it has to be low cost. The students have been brilliant. The new thing they're working on is a blood pressure device that will allow you to put something on your wrist and then it will a light will flash. It's very tiny. A light will flash at the higher limit. 
It's for community-based to see if a woman has high blood pressure, could they then get that woman to a facility? Obviously, there's a lot of interest in this right now. The next device is a protein test. You know, we started to look at the whole issue of protein tests and looking at those reagents. You know, reagents are really cheap. That wasn't the problem. The problem was how to put it in the medium. We tried, the, my developers tried the printer. My physicians and I had midwives, everybody was involved and they used the printer. But the problem is we don't have electricity, kind of expensive, it's not gonna work. Then they tried the next printer press, but still too expensive, wasn't stable enough, wasn't gonna work. They tried the press where you press on, you know, see if that changes colors. Still too expensive. The whole goal is to make it inexpensive. And so right now, this uh, actually, um, Obama did uh, Innovations Awards recently. He gave uh, grants to, to groups. He gave us a grant. We're studying this now in Nepal. We're testing this out to see if this would be amendable to, um, all it's going to do is change one color, blue, just one color. But it may change from here, but this is the thinking, that we have to, as a health team, come up with this. And you've got nurses and midwives all involved in this, because they're the ones out there that are trying to figure out if this can work. And so, I've given you a lot of what's going on in our world. At the same time, we have so much more to do. At the same time, I meet this nurse in Rwanda. This nurse who had a change that she wants to make in the world. If you were to ask this woman, this nurse, what she's trying to change, what she told me is, come see me teach. Because I've got pregnant women that don't know anything about their pregnancy. So I met her in the clinic, and she was going over. Now, you can't understand this. This is a facility off a road in a community. This is out in the open. This is, there's no roof here. Um, the women are all sitting there, and she carries out this model that someone had given her. And she had flip charts because the women don't speak English. I mean, don't, you know, don't understand uh, literature or reading. And she went through in this very informative, soft way, guiding them as to why it's important for them to take care of themselves and what it means. This is her change. This is the types of nurses that I'm seeing around the world. Without question, all of these individuals in these photos are individuals that are making the change in their world. I'm just, hold on one second. I'm just noticing. Okay, they moved my slides. Never mind. One can always use them. One of the things that we constantly are looking at when we're talking about nurses is how we look at the environment and what can be done with the environment. You know, as nurses, we're going to worry about infection prevention. We're going to say, you know, you can have the latest strategies, but if you don't have infection prevention, then obviously we're going to lose that, that individual. We're going to lose that mother. So everything we do in these worlds is looking at nurses working in every setting in all parts of the world, and each of these nurses is doing what they need to do they're experts in education. They're experts in practice. Nurses around the world are leading in the ministry. They're, they're leading in their schools. They're leading in their community. They're in all different settings. This is the role that nurses are doing. This is what our profession is doing around the world. This picture I put in only because it's an extraordinary story of nurses. This is after tsunami. And after tsunami, as you know, there were 110,000 people that died in the Indonesian tsunami. And after that tsunami, six hospitals were destroyed in the Aceh region. 14 districts out of 21 were destroyed. There were no centers, there was no place for a woman in crisis to deliver a baby. These women said, no way. We have to figure this out. They're from that area. They've been traumatized. They've had a horrible situation. But they said, we're going to find a place in this facility. We're going to fix it up. We're going to paint it. We're going to get buckets. We're going to clean. We're going to figure out so women that need a C-section, women that are in crisis, will have a place to go. This is the role that nurses play in the world in which we live. 
This is the role that all of us should be so proud of. These are nurses that were, again, constantly, everywhere I go, I have nurses that are working to learn. They're working to learn the latest. They want to know. They want to understand. They want the benefits that we all have of having constant information. They don't have that. So what I wanted to share with you is three stories. Three stories of who I see as nursing heroes. Individuals that I see that are paving the way for all of us. The first one is Pashtun. Pashtun is a midwife that I met, a nurse midwife that I met in Afghanistan. The time I met her, Pashtun was being voted in as the president of the Afghan Midwife Association. I will tell you it's the first time there in that country there was ever an association for women, and certainly a midwife association. And Pashtun was voted in. And Pashtun stood up there, and in front of all these other midwives, they all raised their hands and pledged to improve the health of their own people. They pledged to make sure that women live in their country, that they have a decent life, that they deliver babies safely, that their children are healthy. I watched her as she was being pulled in multiple directions in that country because she was brilliant. She is brilliant. And she was pulled in multiple directions. The government wanted her. They wanted her to teach. But she was adamant. We must have women that are skilled to take care of our pregnant women. To me, this is one of your heroes of the world. Now, the beautiful part is, uh, in some ways, she is now the WHO regional advisor out in Asia. She's living in India. But she's still got that grasp on global health and what needs to happen. She will be a voice that all of you will hear. She has spoken in Washington. She, I, she spoke on Capitol Hill. She has been in many places with us. She's, been, she's incredible. Another nurse, Amanda. Amanda is from Ghana. Amanda knew and has seen cervical cancer deaths more than most of us. Amanda knew about this program, and Amanda said, not only do I want to learn how to do screening, it's called single visit approach, screening and treating. Not only do I want to do that, but I want to teach others, and I want to make sure we screen. Amanda's one that didn't give up. She created systems so that they could put cervical cancer screening in women's health clinics. Amanda was one that no matter what her change was, my country shouldn't have women dying of cervical cancer. I will take responsibility to look at where we can put a cervical cancer screening program and we will start to screen. And her and a group of nurse midwives went out there and in their first few, several years, screened 18,000 women. That's her change that she wants to see in the world. That's what this individual is doing. She's my nursing hero. The last one I want to mention is Asmuyani, a nurse midwife in Indonesia who had seen the number one reason women die, hemorrhage. She was part of that study, adamant that women could be taught to take pills at the right time and save their lives. And so when I look at Asmuyani, I say, yes, she had her change that she wanted to see in the world. So when you look at these three women and you see these different stories, you say, each of them, they may come from different cultures, they may come from different religions, but each of them had the change that they wanted to see in the world. They advocated, they educated, they demonstrated, they innovated. Each of these nurses took evidence-based practice and put it into their everyday nursing profession. Each of these individuals is everything Florence Nightingale and all of us espouse for our nursing profession. This is our nursing profession. So what's our journey ahead? Our journey ahead is to continue to accelerate and look at how we take what we know, and we know a great deal, and move it forward and scale it up. It's certainly to discover new approaches. There's a lot of concern right now with urban sprawl. When you look at, right now, it is believed that 50% of our world lives in urban areas. It is believed in 20 years, 60%. 
Asia has the highest number of urban dwellers. Africa is moving quickly. The unfortunate thing is with Africa, the UN has said they estimate that 72% of urban dwellers in Africa are living in slums. There has to be a science and evidence that we as nurses look, look at for individuals living in that setting. What do we need to do differently? What are new skills? What do we need to bring the science, the evidence? There is also much more research now about non-communicable diseases, diabetes, heart disease, let there be no doubt. All these countries I'm talking about are now seeing in their statistics the advent of fast, quickly rising diabetes and heart disease in their women. So now they have both. We also need to continue to integrate our communities and our individuals into everything that we do. They need to drive the program. It is their work. It is their country. I say to people all the time, we're not just going to be, we're not just going to be successful with the discovery of some of these new innovations. Our success is getting these innovations out to countries and having them adopt them, having them use that. That's truly our success. And so, as I close in this talk, I look at our global world. And I say to all of you, we are one world. We are one profession of nursing. And as one profession of nursing, we must all look at this incredible skill set we all have, this incredible science basis we all have. It is, it is such a profession. What profession allows you to be so many different things in one profession? But most importantly, what profession allows you to focus on making the global world healthier? This is our role. And so do I say to our students, wherever you work, whatever you do, whatever you choose to do, you are making an impact on the global world. You are bringing evidence to practice. You are helping us understand what's next. If we can affect the global world the way I believe we can moving forward, we will have such a healthier and positive world for women and children to live in. And so I say to all of you, as one global world, as a global world that has incredible opportunities, let us go out and let us be the change that we want to see in the world. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> it just occurred to me, I think they asked uh, if people wanted to ask questions. I have no problem. Do people have qu questions? Come on, students. Have a question. <laughs> You're my future colleagues. I want you to think about something I didn't say. 70 to 80 percent of the whole health workforce in the world are nurses. In rural Africa, it's 80 to 85 percent. Think about the power we have in numbers. Think about that. Questions? Yes, please. Hi, Lori. What's your name? My name is Lauren. Okay. No, I love, actually, it's a great story. I was just telling some of the faculty here. It's actually a great story. Um, <laughs> Chupaigo, 40 years ago, was founded by a group of OBGYNs. Now, I, let me just say they're brilliant because obviously I'm leading the organization now. Um, uh, they have, you know, there's a nurse leading it. Um, but the, it was founded as Johns Hopkins Programs and International Education for GYNs and OB. So what they wanted to do was look at access to reproductive health, which is right. But what did they learn? Don't tell. What did they learn? If you're going to look at helping women access health care, who's out there? Nurses and midwives. How can you have a title of GYNs and OB? That's not going to help women get care. So very early on, within it took a number of years, I understand, and then they stopped using um, the explanation. But let me tell you something. This is a cute CEO story. 
Um, I actually tried to look at changing this name when I came. I thought it was a no-brainer. Change the name. Jane's laughing. She knows this whole story. Um, <laughs> let's change the name. Um, and I, I really did think it was a low-hanging fruit as a, as a CEO. And um, I said to the staff, you know, I'm really thinking it's not, you know, it's not marketing. You know, we are known in the international arena. Everyone knows us. WHO, UN, everybody knows us. But here, it didn't have branding. I came nine years ago. So I thought this will help with branding. So I actually started out trying, you know, trying to change the name. And I knew I would get a, rea you know, the staff would be concerned. And they were, appropriately so. They loved the name. And because they knew how to pronounce it. And, um, but here's what happened. I went out to Africa, and I started going country to country. And ministers of health would come up to me saying, I heard you're trying to change the name. <laughs> WHO would come up and say, I heard you're trying to change the name. This went on and on and on. The word traveled. In fact, I was just in a country, I won't even tell you where, where the USAID leader, I told him this story, and he goes, you weren't thinking of changing the name. Leslie, I was taught by them. And I think because we've taught so many people, and it's so branded, they thought that it was ridiculous. And in essence, it became very clear to me that everyone knew Japigo except for the United States. So in the end, because we were so heavily branded, and because people were bringing out their certificates from training by Japigo, I was recently in uh, Congo, and a physician, I said, do you know Japigo? And he goes, do I know Japigo? And he went into his cabinet, and he brings out, he goes, 25 years ago, you trained me, you know. So, I mean, in that sense, it has a branding. So that's a long answer, but I thought you'd like the CEO's side of it. Other questions? Yes, please. Um, it's HPV. It's um, partnerships. There's a lot of reasons. But remember, we'd probably have it here. But we get screened early on. You go for pap smears very early on. So, you know, some of you have had atypical studies. And then, you know, uh, but again, it's that. It's the co-infections with other things, like I said, HIV, AIDS, and the like. Um, it's co it also is STDs. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's the environment. Other questions? Yes, yes Dean? Okay, I'm ready. What happens after we screen yes. and we find that people need care? Yes. We have problems accessing it here. Yes. In some of the situations in which you find yourself, yes. how then do you take the next step? You know, I think that's I think that's a valid question. I think we won't do screening. Um, for example, on cervical cancer, we won't do screening unless there's a referral system built in. But I think that that's some of the challenges we're having. If you look at things like breast cancer, if you look at other things, we're all trying to look at what could be done if they don't have um, chemotherapy, if they don't have treatments. Like, so I think it's a responsibility for all of us to look at what's next in that chain of that system. Because uh, to be honest, that's what happens. Some groups go in, they do the one piece, but then when you refer, there is no referral. So I personally don't necessarily want to discover something, refer, and know that there is no one educated to handle that. Obviously, with cervical cancer, the countries that we're in currently have the ability to manage a, lar a larger tumor. Uh, what you hope is you're going to catch up. You hope that you're going to start screening more and more so that you're getting them smaller and smaller. So if we can get them the first time screening a woman and she's 40, uh, that's where the risk is. Other questions? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Hi. Maddie. Hi. Um, What's your name? Maddie. Hi, Maddie. Um, I'm a senior nursing student. Okay. And I think that uh, this whole presentation was really inspiring, but how do you suggest, um, as new nurses, we like, could get involved with the like, Sure. How do you? Well, I think it's um, how you can look at global health, how you can get involved in global health. Um, I do have students that uh, come to me, uh, certainly from the School of Nursing at Hopkins. I have public health students that come to Japigo. They work in our office in Baltimore. We have some students um, that go to the field, but of course we need that field placement. But I also think there's opportunities. There's groups. There's 
Uh, many of the universities have programs where you can get exposed. See, what you're gonna need at some point is to have exposure to other cultures. If you want to do international, you need that exposure. You also, can I say this? You also wanna get a graduate degree. I hate to tell you that, but you know. <laughs> She'll like that. But you need, you know, but you really want, so you know, you, you can practice, but go get that graduate degree. Um, because that graduate degree allows you a lot more flexibility in what organizations internationally you, can, you will work with. Um, you know, a lot of our nurses, you know, quite often have master's degrees. So, you know, that's what you want. But there are, like, um, I know there's a, you know, and it doesn't need to be always necessarily in nursing. What you wanted, there's, pro, there's a program with, I know there's one where uh, there's a number of universities participate, and you go out to South Africa and you do health, education, and development, and you spend, like, six weeks. But what that gives you is that exposure to different components, different awareness, that also creates a resume for you. And uh, you know, it also helps reinforce whether this is what you truly want to do. Um, there's no doubt people take volunteers in their agencies like ours. Um, there's no doubt people uh, have interns. Um, like I said, we, we get a, a lot of number of students that just come in from Hopkins, and, um, and we have them sometimes, you know, going out to the field sometimes. But um, it is, did I know I was going to do this at, when I was your age? No. People, people, I'll tell you that answer already. People always ask me, Leslie, when you were a senior in nursing school, I said, okay, let me set the stage. I grew up in Enfield, Connecticut. I had never been anywhere. I'd never been to Florida. Uh, you know, I really didn't have the, you know, I didn't grow up in a family that we could do that. So, you know, I had not traveled a great deal. I, I wanted to be a pediatric nurse. I wanted to be a pediatric clinical nurse specialist. That was my drive. But, you know, different things came along in my career. You know, different opportunities, opportunities to teach, and I found I loved teaching you know, opportunities to manage and lead, and now I love that. So at some point, I got the opportunity to go and, and uh, be involved with teams uh, to look at healthcare in Poland and Nicaragua and China and Indonesia. China is when, bing, bing. And, um, and because of that, it really framed what I ended up doing in, in the majority of my career. But the, the other thing to do, I have cards to come up and, and take my card because now you know me. And now you always use people that are in the international world. So you take my card and you write as you're moving along. And a lot of times students call me. I get a lot of calls and I talk to them about what they're thinking. So you're more than welcome. You're welcome, Maddie. Anyone else? Yes. Sure. You know, I think that's an interesting one. It goes back to integration. Uh, obviously, our work has not had that silo of disabilities. That is not to say that you're not working with an NGO that's nearby that's doing that. But our challenge moving forward to the future is to figure out how we integrate some of these areas. You know, yesterday I gave a talk at a water summit, and I, kept, I said a water summit. And they said, I was telling some of the faculty this, and I said, they said, Leslie, these are all engineers, but they need to see the impact of the water not having it, what you need it for, why? And so, um, you know, this is a perfect example of how do we get the NGOs, and there's some great NGOs out there doing, working with disabilities, but how do we get ourselves not so isolated? Part of it, the challenge, is the way funding is done. You know, funding is done by certain areas. What we have to figure out is how we do partnerships and find those funding sources that encourage integration. I don't think you're far off. I think there's a lot of discussion on integration and looking beyond. You know, people are talking about financing and water and everything else. I think if we get the right people talking about, okay, let's go look at this. It's kind of like violence in women. You're seeing that talked about everywhere and how we put that into these uh, proposals. 
and how we get that built into our work. It's an issue. It's an issue. There's a question over there. Yes, hi. There she comes. What's your name? Um, my name is Natalie. Hi, Natalie. Um, you mentioned that you work a lot to integrate your programs with other Very good question. You know, a lot of our countries are in turmoil. We're in Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. Uh, we're in Afghanistan. We're in Pakistan. Uh, um, we're all over. We're, you know, um, I think part of it is um, the challenge is there, but there are still women there that need care, and there still are champions within countries. Part of it is finding those champions within a country. Yes, the government may be challenging, but you still have to work with the government. Um, we don't give up just because there's unrest or, or uh, there's um, a disaster or there's a war. Uh, what we have to figure out is how we use our strategies in a different way and work with the government champions. I will tell you there's incredible talent in Africa. There's incredible expertise there. Almost all my staff in Africa are from the countries that we work in. And they're incredibly talented, nurses, midwives, physicians, and the like. They also help because they help you know who some of the champions are in the government and how you can work with that government during a very difficult time in their country. Um, obviously, this, the governments quite often, although they're in turmoil, also want to help their people be healthy. Um, so there's this dichotomy you have to work with. Is it easy? Is it, uh, is it going in and putting a program in? No. Uh, does it take a lot longer? Yes. Does it take thinking and people really having to figure out a new program plan? Yes. Um, and you worry every day. You worry every day about what's going to happen. But uh, we can't give up just because there's turmoil in countries. We can't. Uh, there's one woman every minute dying. I'm not giving up. None of us should give up. But I think that was a, it's a great question to ask. Um, and, and we're all doing it. We are working and making change, even in countries that have very challenging times right now. Thanks. Hi. Yes. There's, um, I, I'm not the expert on what the statistics are for compliance, but I will say that um, we're making it easier for countries to look at regiments, meaning what they need to be taking. The, obviously, the challenge is whether they have those correct drugs, um, and that becomes an issue. You talked about pregnant women, and what I said earlier is one of our challenges is we're not getting them screened. And if you don't know that a mother's screened, if you don't know that she's, when she's pregnant that she has HIV, then the challenge for us is that we didn't give them the drugs ahead of time. And that's something that, you know, I, when I was in uh, Mozambique, I actually saw a woman screened in the village with her children. She asked that her children be screened. Um, and it was fascinating. She let me sit there, and it was outside under a tree, and, um, and uh, I prayed a lot. And, um, and uh, she was not, but I thought... You know, it was a, it's a creative program going household to household so that we capture. You know, there's a lot of stigma with HIV AIDS. So part of our challenge is how do we get the screenings done? So there's midnight runs, we call them, where you go out at night and you go house to house. There's this where you get to know the community. The community health workers are from that community, and they go place to place to place. But, uh, there, you know, we have a long way. I'm, I'm, what I'm really proud of is we're building experts within these countries that are learning a great deal. The HIV AIDS movement has done so much for helping create that awareness in the world about what we're up against. It's, an, it's really incredible. Anything else? One last question. Come on, students, one more. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh. Sorry, I should have repeated the question. Hi. Hi. My name's Kelsey. Um, what year are you? I'm a senior. Oh, good. 
okay? Uh, yes, but you know what? I have all these countries, I have all these programs in French and Poland. We love French people. <laughs> You know, the women's right, I'll start that. I think that's, uh, it's changing country by country. Um, you know, you'd have to, we'd have to sit here and talk about each country and where its movements are going. Um, but when you have a body of people in the world that are speaking out to support those women, those women feel our support, let there be no doubt. But your first question was about, um, now I'll remind me what your first question Oh yeah, what I wanted to talk about is one of the things that I, I showed you men in the pictures, but I didn't talk about it. Uh, you know, I, I wanted, I couldn't talk about everything. Um, one of the strategies we use when we do postpartum hemorrhage, when we work with the misoprostol program, we include husbands in the dialogue of that. Um, when we look at preparedness out in the community, one of the, th the thoughts are if we can help communities figure out what they need, figure out who's pregnant in their community, um, do they have a, um, a vehicle or a transportation, a, a wagon, something, that if a woman's in trouble, they can get her there? So there's this whole like, way to mobilize a community, and you mobilize them with certainly having their, their husbands. When I visited northern Nigeria, you know, it's a very strict part of Nigeria. And um, I met with the leaders of the community, you know, the men, and, and we talked about, you know, how important it was for them to speak out for um, mothers and children. And they came out after the meeting and they uh, stood on the steps and they talked about we must demand that we have care for our mothers and children. Now, I'm saying this because that's one strategy we're all talking about is that we can't isolate everything so that it's just talking with the woman and the child, we must include the family if we can. Um, no doubt it continues to be a challenge, but in Afghanistan, women are getting care now where they never got care before. Women were dying daily. My first trip to Afghanistan, you know, visiting some of the facilities, it was like second nature the way they would talk about the lives of women, that, the women that had lost their lives the night before. But, you know, I have to have optimism. I have to believe that all of us looking and, and demanding that, um, that women have adequate access to health care, that women have and be part of the solutions. Um, and like I said, what you will find in some of these cultures is that there are women speaking out. There's women in government in Indonesia that are extraordinary. Um, you've got first ladies in some of these countries that are very, very strong and powerful. Some of them have platforms around maternal newborn health care. Um, so, you know, I'd rather focus on the, it's there, but I'm going to join the voices that say that if we keep women healthy, we help them survive, we talk about their access, their ability to get educated. Another very big variable for women is getting educated. We must find ways to have women educated around the world because we know with education and with health, women are, can be, they're, they're the economic drivers. What we haven't talked about a lot, because that wasn't this talk, is about the, what role women play in the world. They are the economic drivers of the world. When you look at the roles they play in the farms, in the markets, you know, this is something that we must be adamant about. If they are the economic drivers, why are we not willing to educate them and have them be healthy? And that's something that I will continue to, to look at. There's a lot of research now about looking at uh, the GDP 
and the effect of a lost uh, a woman losing her life and the effect on GDP in the world. I think as we start to build the economic piece to this, it's going to be very powerful. And I think we all need, again, that wasn't how we wrapped our arms around it before. We just talked about this situation, but I think that's going to be an important variable moving forward. Economy, as you know, big thing everybody's talking about. Let's talk about the woman's role in the economy. Let's talk about the nurse's role in saving these people and having healthier lives. If nurses are helping people be healthier, think about the economy that way. Okay. Yeah,